Hi, my name is Susan Bowman. I'm the founder of The Pool Ministries and the writer of this book, The Quiet Heart, A Foundational Guide to Inner Healing and Deliverance. You can purchase this book on my website, thepoolministries.org. It's available in paperback and it's available in all e-formats also as well. Today's lesson, we're going to talk about the guide that is on the inside or the inner witness and reflective reasoning in this series called Hearing God. First, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we need a clean, safe place within which to learn. We ask you to provide that. You are our teacher. You are our healer. Teach us. Help us understand so that we're better able to hear you and talk with you and know you. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's start with figuring out what the inner witness is. Now God has always guided his people. In the Old Testament, Psalms explains that God, in Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Psalm 23, 2 and 3, He leads me beside quiet water. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. Now, God, uh, God guides Christian believers, those of us who have given ourselves to Jesus, from within, because the Spirit of God dwells within us. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Do you not know that you are a temple of, the, of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. God dwells within us. We do not need to go to another person. We don't need to go out there to connect with God. God has connected with us and indwells us. For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 2 Corinthians 6.16 6, A temple is a place where God dwells. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and in you, if you are a believer. Galatians 2.20 Now, since we have the Holy Spirit within us, we have the guide on the inside. And one component of this inner witness is the inner assurance of salvation. 1 Corinthians 6.17 says it this way, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. My spirit joined with his spirit. Your spirit joined with his spirit. The spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit himself, testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. Romans 8, 16. Now, this assurance of salvation and connection with God is challenged by the enemy. Oh, yes, you better believe it is. He approaches us with the age-old strategy of challenging what God has said or challenging God's existence, which I suppose is challenging what he has said. For example, here's what he might do. He asks questions, but his questions are always posed as challenges. Has God really said that you are forgiven? Has God really said that he loves you? Has he really said that you're clean or that you're valuable or that he cares? You don't really believe God is real, do you? Only stupid people believe in God. You don't want people to think you're stupid, do you? <clears throat> or the gold standard of all attacks, you're not saved. Now, all of these challenges are attempts by the enemy to hook into any lie-based heart belief, this painful heart beliefs, and control you with that heart belief. Now, to learn more about how the enemy does this and what you can do to counter it and to step up into the fullness of a beautiful relationship with the Lord, see my teachings on your identity in the heart on, on my YouTube channel. And also, that subject is the primary focus of this book. Now, when I was first saved, I was converted in college, but I actually had <clears throat> gone to high school, graduated, got married, got divorced, 
went to college, so I'm not exactly in order here uh, chronologically. But when I was in college and I was converted, um, I was very tormented with unbelief. Now, my father was an active atheist and my mother was a lapsed Catholic, so unbelief was really rampant in my family. So there's a lot of unbelief. And I was very tormented with unbelief about whether God was real and if he was real that I was saved. And I remember I was, would listen to this torment in my head and eventually the spirit within me rose up and I shouted, if he isn't real, then why can I do this? And I proceeded to pray in tongues. Now, that shut that voice up. Now, if for some reason you are disconnected from your human spirit, feeling attached to the Lord and safe within that relationship is going to be muted. So, so look, I discuss why in chapter 14 of The Quiet Heart. Now, just a note here. I just want to point this out. We don't have any trouble hearing from the devil. So why do we think it's hard to hear from God? Did you ever think about that? Now, what does this inner witness or this guide on the inside look like? Now, when Sam and I were children's ministers, we taught kids to pay attention to how they felt on the inside when meeting new people or facing different situations or making a decision. And we would use a red light, green light. Does it feel like a red light on the inside? Stop. Or does it feel like a green light on the inside? Go. Cold, yucky, and we, I remember we had cold spaghetti for them to feel. Or a warm, fuzzy, a plushy animal, something soft and cuddly. What does it feel like on the inside when you're making a decision, or making a new friend, or trying to, yeah, trying to make a choice? What does that feel like? The inner witness, that guide on the inside, will put a stop there if it's not safe, or a go there if it is. Learn to listen to it. Become aware. Now, that is the inner witness at its most basic. And it's a great place to start learning to tune into your inner witness with a stop, a go, a cold icky, a warm fuzzy. Okay? All right. Now, the knower, that's capital K-N-O-W-E-R, is another manifestation of the inner, inward witness. And this is expressed as deep certainty about something. Now, often the knower activates in prayer ministry when I'm praying with somebody, and I'll ask the person I'm praying with, after we work through a heart belief, I'll just ask, how does that feel? And the person will tune into herself and report that it feels finished or not. That's the knower that is part of our inner, inner witness on the inside of it. She knows, yes, we're done. She knows, no, we're not. Something on the inside of us because we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Now, other times, you can just know something for no obvious reason. I remember years ago, I was a brand new Christian, just filled with the Holy Spirit, and I was working at a, uh, at a center uh, as a as their editor and the, the lady that worked at the front desk was a spirit-filled Christian and I can remember that uh, She told me that one some other young lady there was involved in drugs and some other things I asked how she knew and she said well people with the Holy Spirit just know They just know things and that's true and it turned out she was absolutely correct and that young lady bless her wherever she is now was actually very much steeped in the drug culture. I, I didn't know that because I was, you know, ignorant of those things. <clears throat> okay. My husband and I uh, had been, um, uh, had joined a church very quickly, elevated into a position of, uh, of responsibility that was, that the pastor um, wanted us to share with another couple that had been in the church previous to us going there. And we met with this other couple, went out to have dinner together, and my husband, his name is Sam, was very excited to have another married couple to fellowship with, and was enjoying himself fellowshipping with the husband, and I was talking with the wife, actually I was listening and watching, and inside of me, I knew that something was wrong. I didn't know what it was, but I knew there was something 
wrong and that this couple was not going to be good for us. And I explained that to Sam who um, didn't hear me. And sure enough, it turned into a very disastrous relationship. And it was bad for us personally, very bad, and very bad for the church. But I knew on the inside to beware of this couple before I had any evidence. I pretty quickly got evidence of why I felt that way. But at the time, it was my inner witness, the Spirit of God that dwells in me and in you, if you have Christ, Spirit of the Lord inside of me was going, Whoo, call Jackie, call Jackie, stop, stop, stop. Green light, red light, red light. And I didn't listen. And, and the reason I didn't, I mean, I did listen and I knew it and I was braced for it. But because my husband didn't get the same, didn't get this, well, he wasn't tuned to that. And he was more tuned to, gee, yay, we have a couple to be friends with. I went along with that. Now, I'm more mature now, and I'm less likely to go along to get along as I was back then because we've learned, both of us, my husband and I have matured in this, that we need to pay attention to what the other person is hearing from the Lord and respect it. Okay. So, learn to lean in into that inner witness and bring it before the Lord. You just don't feel right about something or you feel really good about something, you need to take that to the Lord and ask him, what am I, you know, what am I hearing here? And as time goes by, you'll get very skillful at recognizing your knower and the inner witness and you'll begin to trust it. Now, one thing I want you to be aware of is that our inner witness, another way of the stop, go, green light, red light is peace or no peace. When the inner witness guides us by peace, when we know that we've obeyed our inner witness, which in other words, we've obeyed the Holy Spirit, we've gotten in agreement with the Holy Spirit, there's peace on the inside. Maybe chaos on the outside, but on the inside there's peace. There's an inner knowing that we are where we're supposed to be. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, Colossians 3.15. And... Another way to recognize that your inner witness is activated is when you begin to feel uneasy within yourself. Now, Dr. Jim Reich described it this way. I'm reading from his writing. Just recently, an opportunity presented itself for me to go back to Bible college for more schooling. I researched and got information on the college in order to make an informed decision. As I was thinking and praying about it, I lost my peace. In other words, I begin to feel uneasy about it in my spirit. There's your cold yucky. God was using this check, stoplight, or hesitation in my spirit to get my attention and to help me avoid a wrong decision. Once I decided I was not going to go back to college at that time, my peace returned. God gave me peace in order to guide me to make the right choice. I understand that God had other things planned. So, one thing I want to point out here is that the peace on the inside, that, that uneasiness versus the peace, can sometimes be overlaid with a lot of chaos going or confusion or busyness going on in our outside lives that can cause us to not really tune in to peace or uneasiness. So just be, you know, take the time. I know it's often difficult to find the time, but it doesn't take long. Go lock yourself in the bathroom, sit with God with whatever decision you're facing, and just say, Lord, you know, I need to know in my knower, is this you? Just do it. Practice it. Now, one thing that this will cheer you up if you're worried about whether you're going to miss it or not, the inner witness does not go away. It just doesn't go away. So, if you don't have... You, this means several things, but the first, you don't have to act immediately, especially when you're honing your skills in this area. You don't have to immediately, okay, 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 I don't have peace, so we can't do that. You can spend some time with the Lord and make sure, because this isn't the only way that God talks to us, but this, this is the way that he confirms what he's saying to us is with this inner witness. Okay, so you can check it, check it out by waiting and by looking for confirmation coming in in other ways, okay? Now, keep in mind the inner witness does not force you, compel you, or demand. It doesn't dominate, but it just doesn't go away. Now, keep in mind that fear is not necessarily a stop or a red light. 
Sometimes it's fear of the un unknown or of possible consequences. Now here's an example. Um, so qu quite a while back, um, in order for me to stay home with my son, who's intellectually challenged, he had, had uh, finished his schooling, what there was that was available for him. He wasn't able to work yet. When he was able to work, he was going to need somebody to drive him. He just needed a parent with him. And I needed to come home from the workplace. So I did come home from the workplace, but I'm the kind of person who also needs meaningful work. And we were children's church pastors at that time, and we had taken up uh, experimenting with clowning uh, because uh, what my co-pastor wanted us to. And from that, the Lord wanted me to build an entertainment business, and I did. But for me, I'm not really, it's maybe hard to believe, but I'm really a rather shy person, and I'm, I'm not, I'm kind of introverted. Uh, so I like performing and entertaining so long as it's very planned out and been rehearsed. I don't like just walking into a stranger's place and, you know, having to be the center of attention. So to me, it wasn't a really good fit. Yet, I was really, really sure, and there were so many ways God showed me that he wanted me to take our clowning that we had done in children's church and use that to expand into the children's entertainment business, which we did, and, and, and we did for quite a number of years and became successful at it. But I was very, 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 very afraid. Very afraid. Nonetheless, I had more peace going forward than I had shrinking back. But the fear was not the inner witness. The fear was my own anxiety and lack of confidence. Um, so being afraid isn't necessarily that red light. You're going to have to walk with the Lord with this, and that's what you should do. Now, here's some things that may interfere with you hearing or recognizing your inner witness. And the biggest problem is a division between your soul and your spirit. Now, the spirit is the soul's connection to God. Remember we said earlier that, that your spirit is one with his spirit? So when trauma or lies that you believe here cause a division between the soul and the spirit, then your inner witness may become muted. You just may not trust it. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. That's Hebrews 4.12. Now, a lot of people have taught this and taught a lot of things about it. Now, I personally do not believe that the soul and the spirit are supposed to be divided. Now, the soul and the spirit are separate aspects of your being, but they shouldn't be divided. They should be in unity. Now, Jesus warned us that no house divided will stand in Mark 3, 25. And this word of God that's living and active and sharper, it touches right where your soul and your spirit are divided for the purpose of pointing it out to you for the purpose of healing that dividedness. Now, being here's something that will divide you from your soul. Your soul and your spirit will get sideways with each other. When you're forced to submit to outside authority, when that authority is too heavy-handed, or it's wrong, or it's gaslighting you, or it's abusive, or arbitrary, or somehow damaging. And this may cause you to tune out your nurturing human spirit, which says, you're really tired. You shouldn't try to do that. It's time to rest. While the outside authority is saying, you better get that done, Missy, or you're going to get it. <laughs> you know, so you have to choose. What are you going to listen to? That nurturing human spirit that comes from God that desires to nurture you or that heavy-handed authority figure who's going to smack you. Well, the child's going to listen to this because they don't want to be smacked. They're afraid. That will cause a division that you carry into your adult life between your soul and your spirit. You can't. You turn it off. You turn off your spirit. Ask the Lord to help you turn your spirit back on. Okay? And another issue with this is that when you've been trained or programmed, if you will, to listen to that outside authority, you can get under the authority of an abusive leader, a boss, a pastor, and you, you, you have to do what they say. You, you can't listen to the spirit within you because you learned early in life that that was dangerous. So that makes you very vulnerable to being uh, spiritually abused. So, you know, lay that before the Lord. Okay, judgment against your human spirit may mute the inner witness also. And when something happens and blame falls on your spirit, 
You may vow to never listen to or trust your spirit again. And we go into that some in this book. Okay, now another thing that will keep you from obeying your inner witness is a trained conscience that runs counter to what the Lord is showing you. Now, this is the way you are expected to do life. And here's an example. My husband's a bowman, and there is a bowman way of doing things. And only physical labor was honorable. <clears throat> Even leisure had to be spent hunting and fishing, putting food on the table. But the Lord led Sam into arts and, enter and entertainment and hobbies that don't put food on the table directly. And um, it, it was difficult for him to follow the Lord into these things. His conscience that had been trained as a child, that everything that he did had to be productive of food on the table, had to be, had to be providing for the family. Anything that wasn't that was a waste of time and wasn't you know, to be embraced or accepted. But he was, but he was being. His design was such, and the Lord was drawing him into those kinds of things. But his conscience was fighting him and throwing guilt and shame and all these questions at him, and so he was not able to follow the Lord fully for a long time until he got that healed, and and well, and became aware of what the battle was really about. So what we've been taught, also, can interfere with listening to the inner witness. Now, when I was a a new Christian, very zealous, was going to a spirit-filled church, very small, excited spirit-filled church, and we were having revival, and we had flyers made up, and we were exhorted to go out and put these flyers everywhere. Well, I was in graduate school at university, and one of the my fellow graduate students was um, the son of a Presbyterian minister. <coughs> Excuse me, high church type of fellow. And when he saw my, I came up to him and was so excited because to me he was a fellow believer, my brother in the Lord. And I was going to invite him to the revival and tell him about it. But inside of me I was hearing, stop, 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 stop. I was feeling it. Stop, stop, er, er, check, check, check. And I just, I knew that I was supposed to do what my pastor said. So I rode right over that check, gave the guy the revival uh, uh, flyer. And he just, he was so contemptuous of me. And so it's people like you that keep people from being saved, intelligent people from being saved. And I was crushed. And the Lord wanted to spare me that. <clears throat> so sometimes what we're taught will teach us to push back the stop. Another thing that keeps us from hearing from our inner witness, or we can hear from it and not heed it, it's just ignorance. We just don't know what the inner witness is. We don't know to listen to it. We don't know how it works. And another thing is fear of people, fear of disappointing people. I remember when uh, this ministry was first getting on its feet. It was, oh gosh, I guess 20, over 20 years ago. Um, some friends wanted to help us set up a nonprofit. And uh, uh, they came over to the house, they, they did all the paperwork, they set up the nonprofit, and they had things rolling. Well, I just stood there wanting to say, no, 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 I'm not ready. It's just, y'all are going too fast for me. I need some processing time. But I was afraid to say no, even though everything inside of me was saying, slow down. Now, another issue is lie-based heart beliefs. Now, your heart is the boss of, of you as far as what you believe. So if you distrust all authority, if all the authority in your early childhood was uh, not honorable, then you may not listen to your inner witness. You may believe, you may treat your human spirit, the Holy Spirit uh, that, that manifests this inner witness within you as an authority figure that's not to be trusted. Now I had this problem um, I can remember in my early times with the Lord how much I longed to listen to the Holy Spirit and do what He would tell me to do. But if He told, if I heard within me go left, I went right. If I heard within me stop, I I, I went two steps further. I, I I did the opposite of whatever I was hearing within me and whatever my inner witness was showing me. If my inner witness said stop, I I would go. And, and I, re I asked the Lord, I went before the Lord and said, why am I so disobedient? I was so distressed about it. And he said, 
you know, it's not that you're disobedient. It's that the authority in your early life was not trustworthy. So I had an inner vow, a heart belief, that to never forget that authority is not to be trusted and, and to do the opposite of what they said, a vow to just not do what they said. So with some work and some healing and some breaking of vows, I'm now able to hear the inner witness. And most of the time, I'm not 100%, most of the time, pretty quick, catch uh, when my inner witness is saying yes or saying no. Now, here's some examples of the inner witness. <clears throat> so, the latest big example of ignoring the inner witness, my husband and I, my mother was uh, had passed away. Once the will was settled, my husband and I knew that we needed to move to a larger home because where we were, we were very crowded and the neighborhood had become, oh, well, we're so far away from taking Jay to work and back and things were just not what we wanted them to be. So we began house hunting and we found this house that on, at least on the surface seemed to be exactly what we needed. But we kept running into roadblock after roadblock. They accepted our offer, but we didn't realize that the house was in bankruptcy. We didn't realize uh, a number of things that came out after we had made an offer on the house and it had been accepted. Now, the more as time went on, the more anxious I got about this house. And the more I would go over there and look around and think, we have enough money to buy the house, but we don't have enough money to do the major repairs that were becoming obvious the more we looked at the house and the more anxious I got about it. But at the same time, we felt like we had to buy the house because we had we had made an offer and it had been accepted and we had signed papers and everything was going forward and we couldn't disappoint anybody. And, and, and it's sort of like getting married. You, you know, you feel like you've gone so far, even though you're getting cold feet, you can't back out now because you've invested too much into it. And you just hope for the best. It had that feeling to it. And finally, one day I woke up, Sam had left to go. I think he had gone out of town to go bird watching. And I, I couldn't even be still. My, my, the anxiety, the, un, not, the uneasiness, the, 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 on the inside in my inner witness had, had grown to such a point that I picked up the telephone, called our realtor and said, we don't want the house. And she said, I've been waiting for this call. I knew it was coming. I will let the people know. And that was it. I mean, she was on it immediately. And I want you to know that, and, and Sam walked in and I, and I said, well, I said, I withdrew our offer from the house. And he was like, what? What? I go out of town and I come back and we're not buying the house. But you know, when we sat down and talked about it, we both felt that way. We both had that uneasiness on the inside of us. That this wasn't right for us. But we were going ahead anyway. But the inner witness does not stop. And thanks be to God that we find, he finally broke through all our busyness and our rushing forward and need to accomplish our goal to where we were able to pick up the phone and go, no, this is a mistake, we're not gonna do it. We found the house that we have now, which we absolutely love, and it's much better for us than the other one, oh, probably a week later. So, hallelujah. Listen, learn to listen to your inner witness. Ask God to teach you to listen to your inner witness, and you need to practice. We need to become skillful listeners of the inner witness, hearers of the inner witness, and it's only achieved by practice. Yet everyone fails at it sometimes. There's a learning curve, and that is okay. Did you know that the human brain is designed to mature when we make mistakes? And if we get it right, the brain doesn't make any forward progress. It doesn't grow. Now that's built into our design, so it must mean that mistakes are okay. So there's a learning curve. And it's okay. It's part of the design. Okay. God is loving and faithful and patient to get his messages to us. And even if we make mistakes, it's okay. Because we have him, it's okay. Now, there's one other way of hearing God that I want to cover quickly in this lesson. In our next lesson, we're going to talk about prophecy. Not us prophesying so much as hearing God through prophecy coming from other people. That will be our next lesson. But let's look at reflective reasoning here. Reflective reasoning is the intentional seeking after guidance, understanding, and insight from the Lord, and sometimes with the help of other believers. It's intentional. You, you are seeking God. You, you want Him to give you His advice. Now, the Lord invites us to reason with Him. He does not expect us to magically know 
what to do. He is well aware of the challenges we face. As a matter of fact, um, just this morning, I told the Lord I would not have a problem living here in the fall in all the darkness and all the suffering. I would not have as much of a problem. It does make me uncomfortable. Uh, but it would be easier for me to live here if it wasn't for the confusion of not knowing. And then when you do know, it's like, you know, duh, how did I not know that? The confusion is what it challenges us. And God knows that we live in a confusing um, environment because of the fall. So he's kind and he's patient. and But he doesn't let that get us out of, of doing the work of learning how to hear his voice. So we're going to intentionally seek him. And this is one way that we do it. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. And have you ever reasoned, sat down and reasoned something out? That's a process. That was Isaiah 118, by the way. Now, reflective reasoning is one way to receive immediate help. Now, I use it in prayer ministry sessions all the time. And the first Christians used it to resolve the problem of Judaizers who were troubling Gentile converts. Now, Judaizers were... Uh, uh, Jewish people who had become Christians, but they kept to the old Jewish ways. And so they had one foot in Judaism and one foot in Christianity. And they went around telling Gentile Christians that in order to be saved, they had to become Jews. Okay. Now, this is from Acts 15. Since we have heard that some of our number, to whom we gave no instruction, have disturbed you with their words, unsettling your souls... It seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore we have sent Silas and Judas, who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that's Acts 15, 24 through 28. Now, the phrase, of one, one, of one mind, is homo thum, homo thum a done, a unique Greek word that helps us understand the uniqueness of the Christian community. It creates an image of flowing in unison. The image is almost musical. A number of notes are sounded which, while all different, harmonize in pitch and tone as the instruments of a great concert under the direction of a concert master. Think of reflective reasoning as you and the Lord harmonizing together. Now we can, that's, we can also reflect upon our circumstances, surroundings, or the actions of other people in order to receive instruction from the Lord. So we're asked, we have a question before the Lord. For example, should I marry? <clears throat> And um, as we go through our day, the Lord will be drawing our attention to different things and different people and different circumstances that he wants us to reflect upon so that we can arrive at an answer. Uh, Proverbs 24, 30, uh, 30 through 34 exemplifies this. I pass by the field of the sluggard and by the vineyard of the man lacking sense. And behold, it was completely overgrown with thistles. Its surface was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. When I saw, I reflected upon it. I looked and received instruction. Now, my stepdaughter, Deborah, um, told me one time, she didn't get in the trouble her brothers got in. And she told me one time, uh, when she was a teenager, she said, I watch what they do, and I see what happens, and I'm not going to do that. She was reflecting upon her brother's behavior and receiving wisdom. Now, we can research, investigate, ponder, discuss, examine, consult with trustworthy and knowledgeable people, list the pros and cons as part of reflective reasoning. But, until your knower or inward witness activates, you have not arrived at your answer. This goes for all the ways we hear from God. If someone prophesies to you and your inner witness is like, eh, you listen to the inner witness, not that word of prophecy. The inner witness is the gold standard. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are indwelt with God himself. You listen to your inner witness. 
Now, asking for and allowing God's insights during our, our decisions, our life decisions, whether they be big or small, whether they be buying a house or, or choosing a car or, or your church or, you know, even just where to go out to eat if you need to practice. Practice that. It's the key to successful Christianity. Involving God in your life intentionally. Now, when we reflect with the Lord, we receive wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 24, 32. When I saw, I reflected upon it. I looked and received instruction. Let's pray. Father, please tune us into our inner witness and knower. Help us initiate a time of reflective reasoning with you. Now, you can jumpstart a session with the Lord by asking why. Remember that God often starts a conversation by asking a question. That means that he is open to our questions. God bless you and tune in for the next lesson on when God tells you something through another person.